Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Innovation Insights, our conversations with experts about innovation, uncertainty, and how we find opportunities for success as we work to rebuild our economy and our communities. Um, we hope you'll find some inspiration in these conversations to discover some new insights that hopefully lead you to more questions, to innovate some new ideas, to help solve some old or new problems. Um, we are also doing this as part of our outreach for the Amazon Catalyst competition that the NWIRC is sponsoring. So if you haven't had a chance to check out that, I will um, talk about it a little bit more in just a second. I'll introduce myself real quick for those of you who don't know me. I'm Laura Merriam Smith of the Northwest Innovation Resource Center. Um, we're a nonprofit organization located in the um, in Northwest Washington. We work in the five counties of Northwest Washington and we're we're about seeing economic vitality in the region by supporting entrepreneurs, innovators, and inventors uh, with their innovation strategies. Uh, we work with those who are either starting up or scaling up their businesses with the goal of helping them build a customized innovation roadmap to have clear steps about what to do next. We also work to connect them to experts that are part of our just-in-time mentorship network, as well as find the local resources to support them and what they're building. Um, in case you hadn't heard about it yet, um, let me tell you about the Amazon Catalyst competition. This is uh, about strengthening our region through community innovation. We know having worked in this part of the, the Northwest for more than 10 years, there are a lot of really creative, innovative thinkers who have great ideas to solve challenges that we face. So in sponsoring this Amazon Catalyst competition, the NWIRC has teamed up with eight cities in Northwest Washington to give away $10,000 in each city for the best ideas to the individuals or the teams that come up with them. Um, it's really about a program to discover and reward big ideas and hopefully supercharge innovation uh, in this region. And just to be clear, it's not a business plan competition and it's open to any resident of the eight cities uh, to compete in any of the themes um, and be rewarded just for sharing their ideas. So I just wanted to take a quick second for those of you who hadn't seen it yet and show you um, the actual, let me go back and find the right page here. And oh, there we go. Um, so this is the Amazon Catalyst page. These are the eight cities that are participating in the competition. You can click on any one of them and you can discover more about the themes. So for Bellingham, what we're talking about today with Ocean Health, um, this is the theme for, um, for, this, for this particular city, although again, anybody from any of the cities can apply to this theme as long as you're a resident of one of them. Uh, the FAQs um, tell you a lot more questions that you may have about who could apply, when can you apply, how much money is involved. You'll see here there's $5,000 is the first place um, in each city. Um, how you participate, um, evaluation of proposals, et cetera. And then the actual application itself can be found here as well. And as you go through it, you'll notice it's not a, a, a stringent application process. Um, you have to have some um, uh, ability to think quickly and, and write um, very efficiently in terms of what it is that you're gonna say about what you're doing, the problem, the solution. The big thing here also is, you know, you wanna see that we're moving the needle, whether that's a 10 time, time impact, 10 over time or um, accelerating something very quickly, um, be thinking about what that means. Okay, so have a chance, get a, a, please check it out. And if you have any questions about that competition, definitely let me know. That's what we are here to do and help you with uh, if you would like to apply for it. I've got a couple more people, sorry. I'm gonna add a couple more people to the mix here. And then um, just a couple of housekeeping things I'll let you know about. Um, I, I'm gonna keep everybody pretty much on mute for at least the first part of this conversation. It's a pretty small group that we're gonna be talking to at first, um, but um, let you hype up and, and join the conversation um, after we get a chance to kind of run through some things. Um, if you want to um, send a message in the chat, I'd be happy to read off questions that way. Uh, or you can use the raise hand feature, which you can find under the participants button down below. Um, all right, let's see, we've got a couple more here. And then 
we should be good to go. So um, many of you, when you registered for this event, you were expecting to see Joshua Berger. <laughs> um, Josh had a uh, last minute meeting he had to take with the governor today. Um, and as he says, when the boss calls, it's hard to say no. Um, so uh, he had to, to not be able to join us today, but we were fortunate enough to have Chris Mining join us from NOAA's uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. And you are the Director of Engineering Development Division there. So we're really excited to have you here. We also have a, another uh, guest that's here that I just wanted to mention um, who will hopefully be contributing to the conversation a little bit. Um, Randy Hartnell is from Vital Choice if you're not familiar with them as a company, um, starting back in 2001, <laughs> quite some time ago. Um, you guys, I think, were, were really super innovative in thinking about how to get sustainably caught um, good seafood to people. And, and so long-time innovations that you guys have been working on um, there. So hopefully we'll get a chance to hear from Randy uh, as well. Um, I appreciate both of you being here and I appreciate everybody else um, joining us today for this, this virtual event. So I'll let, um, uh, let's just start by talking about, uh, Chris, your background a little bit, maybe tell us a little bit more about um, where, you know, what kind of things you've done, what you've been working on. You're very heavily invested in innovation in the maritime industry. So I think this is a great fit for the conversation today. So yeah, it's wonderful. Well, and, and thanks for the intro. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, good. I'm sorry, Joshua, you know, wasn't here today. You you guys missed out. He's really wonderful, and hopefully he can loop back up with you and, and hear him again. He's a, a great uh, partner. I've loved enjoyed working with him. Um, so my background is uh, I work for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and I've had a variety of roles there. I started off as a ship driver, and I've been on research ships and aircrafts and submarines around the world. Uh, and after that, I came back um, to UW, finished up my master's. So I'm a master's, my background's in uh, engineering. But I've also had to learn oceanography, electronics, software, everything, the amalgam of what the maritime sector is. And specifically at the lab, what we focus on is ocean observing. So we build, design uh, from soup to nuts, uh, ground up systems that can be buoy systems, picture them like very remote weather stations out there. Uh, they can be robotic devices, which we're launching uh, in fleets now with COVID since the ships are inactive, uh, to small autonomous aircraft, disposable sensors, uh, robots that go up and down the ocean, side to side, gliders, really anything that can take a scientific observation and add sensors to it uh, is what our lab is interested in. And I'll give you some examples of that. We're interested in timescales from climate signals, say hundreds of years, all the way up to tsunami signals, which can of course come within seconds. And it was our research lab that developed and invented and uh, transferred to industry the uh, Global Tsunami Observing System, which has uh, a sentinel of buoys out in the deep ocean that measure pressure to a very, very finite resolution down to like a quarter millimeter and 6,000 meters. And that's like the front line towards your tsunami warning system. So if you were offshore, uh, say Long Beach, those buoys rang from a tsunami off of uh, Japan, which actually happened, right? That's where your frontline warning would come from before it would strike land. Um, and that's, that's kind of emblematic of, of, of what we do. It's kind of complete observing systems uh, uh, to help better uh, foster research. We transition those. Sometimes we transition them to uh, other parts of NOAA. Other times it makes sense to transfer it to industry. So we had one that we're working on actively right now that we're transitioning a robot to, to industry and a commercial product. They just made their first commercial sale. So that's super exciting for everybody. Um, the time scales can be very long, right? Developing things for the ocean can take very long. And it's part of the challenge that I hope to talk more about here. Why is that? And it's also something I look towards you to say, how can we make this happen faster? Uh, because the planet simply doesn't have the time, the ocean doesn't have the time that we can just do our business as usual innovation cycles, funding cycles, development. We really need a radical way to rethink that we do innovation to bring those to bear. Um, we've been the beneficiaries of, uh, of many other industries that have, have helped us in the ocean world because the ocean world is, is not well funded. Right? I mean, to give you guys some example, we spend more studying water on Mars than we do on planet Earth. Right? There's just this flip-flop that we somehow haven't captured to people the importance in jobs, 
and climate and all this thing of what the oceans means, which means we need to have a broad constituents base, get to Congress, kind of like what Joshua is doing with Maritime Blue now and saying, look at these jobs, broad spectrum sectors, uh, seafood, protein, sustainable harvested um, things that can just go on forever. Uh, so it, it is, it's an enormous challenge. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell of what I work on. And I'm, I'm glad to, you know, during this conversation, I've got, um, I'll say this, you know, my official job in NOAA, but I also do a whole bunch of maritime things off onto the side that are not officially to my duties. So when it's a NOAA position, you know, I'll say that. And if not, I'll just add in my two cents if it's towards some innovation that's not necessarily an official NOAA position coming. So I'll, I'll be frank with you guys what, what I think some of the opportunities are. Thanks. Definitely, definitely appreciate that. So obviously, I mean, you covered kind of a, a, a broad uh, swath of things there, as does this topic that, that was chosen by the city of Bellingham for the concept of ocean health, um, covers a lot of different things. Maybe we could just kind of talk through what some of the things, some of the industries are that are impacted um, by ocean health uh, and talk a little bit about, you know, which are the ones that have, have some of the biggest challenges facing them. I think framing it as ocean health is a really good way because people understand that and they can understand if we take vital signs to our bodies, what that means as we can take vital signs in the ocean, which might mean temperature, ocean acidification, uh, carbon sequestration. You know, we can measure these things that'll give us some hint of what's going on. The big challenge in ocean health is we are at the really early stage of even understanding fundamental processes in the ocean. Right? And I know several of you are involved in fishing that even managing fish stocks properly, right? We've gone from individual stocks to managing an ecosystem to try to base that because uh, it really is all about the ecosystem. And we've had some success on the West Coast, really, really the outlier. Maybe Alaska on the West Coast is, is an enormous outlier compared to other places. Um, but when I think ocean health, I think of it in, uh, you know, what can be done sustainably, you know? Uh, another way to think of about it is, and my boss uses this all the time, he says, if you like your weather forecast, thank an oceanographer, <laughs> right? So it's really true. Our, our global weather patterns are driven by the ocean. For, for us, it's off the Pacific. When we have the, the blob, maybe some of you have heard of the blob, the, the large warming that's happening off our U.S. West Coast, that's another indicator of ocean health. Well, that affects our weather. That affects our snowpack. That affects how we're going to use resources in the Yakima Valley to irrigate. It's going to affect what the fish do. You know, it affects uh, an enormous amount of this. So understanding, um, you know, the vital signs of this and teasing them all apart, I'll say, is a very early science. It is not well understood. It is not as clear as uh, some other problems that are simply, hey, we know what to do. Insert some money. Problem solved. Right. There's still a, a lot of research questions around that. Certainly. Um, Randy, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts coming from the fishing industry. You've been in, involved in it in a very long time. If there are other industries that you think of too, I mean, definitely the the um, the science of the climate and oceanography. I completely agree. Um, huge impacts. Uh, well, I, as you mentioned, I've been uh, intimately involved with uh, the ocean for probably more than 40 years. I spent 20 plus years as a fisherman in Alaska and working on 20 years as a provider of seafood for people. And so acutely aware of uh, how important the ocean is. And on a larger scale, of course, the 3 billion people get most of their protein from the ocean. So I don't necessarily have solutions, but I have intense, passionate interest in learning all I can about it and helping however I can. We have uh, you know, over 100,000 customers and subscribers to our newsletter. So a big part of what I do is just to try to get as much information as I can and edu educate people. Uh, so that's, I appreciate the invitation. Yeah. I'm really happy to be here today. And uh, uh, it's the one thing that keeps me awake at night. And, uh, are those fish going to come back? And it mm -hmm. is such a big black box, uh, as Chris was alluding to, I just, it's hard to know what's going on out there. In Alaska, we've had some of the, the biggest returns of sockeye salmon that we've ever seen. How is that when 
everybody thinks the ocean is, you know, we're trashing it, acidification, uh, you know, all these problems, yet uh, there are, there is some good news out there. That, uh, uh, and so I'm just here to, to learn what I can and help how I, however, however I can, answer any questions that anybody may have. Great, thanks. So, so let's keep talking a little bit about, um, uh, Chris, maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of the industries that you're working with, um, in particular, that have, have new innovations um, that are, are sort of coming up now, even more so than they were maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, I think, I think a huge one is really going to be, um, and we do this somewhat in, in aquaculture, but it's really the concept of marine permaculture. And permaculture is something that can be done forever, right? It's just the continuous harvesting of things from the ocean. Maybe it's uh, uh, kelp. You know, we've got, uh, we've got wonderful areas to be growing seaweeds from. How could we do that in a permaculture basis? And, and the, the nice thing about that is it's, it's a triple bottom line, right? If we think of permaculture and seaweeds in particular, and, and there's a whole variety of them. Uh, number one, we're growing, you know, a really valuable food source, nutrition, valuable. We've got clean waters off the Northwest. We've got the right environment to do it. Number two is we're providing habitat, right? So, so seaweeds are wonderful habitat for all kinds of kinds of animals. So if we expanded those, those type of kelp beds, um, you know, we would be doing better by the critters that benefit from it. We're also sequestering an enormous amount of carbon, right? And this is, this is not a NOAA study. I'll say this flat out. I, I still need to research it, but by by one measure, the kelp beds of the U.S. West Coast sequester as much carbon as the tropical rainforests do, right? So you have to imagine that. So that's going on. These kelp beds are growing, say, a half meter to a meter per day, right? So there's the opportunity. The bad side of it is they've been devastated, right? So, mm -hmm. so there might be real opportunity there in basically farming seaweed and growing that, and it could be done on a variety of bases. One might be for say marine protected areas that they're, they're nurseries the other would be just flat out farming and the, and the products of that so that's one one application and I'll, I'll mention one for fishing that i think is just fantastic and I, I don't know why it wouldn't work for us here in alaska as well uh, there's a company in iceland that that uh, does deep water cod fishing the cod fillets now are the least valuable uh product for them right so they get the cod they get the fillets the rest of the codfish is used for medical purposes. And their biggest, their biggest product is the cod skin that is being used for a wound and, and diabetic he, he, care healing. Our DOD is a large investor in this Icelandic company. Why can't we do that in the US? They cannot make the product fast enough, right? So how different, and I'll ask Randy, how different is an Icelandic deep water cod compared to our cod, you know, we've got nutrient rich waters, cold water. I bet you there's some similarities there or perhaps even other products that we could, you know, do full utilization of the resource uh, to, to that point, right? So who knows what else might be available out there, but that's just a, a super shining example. The studies have been done, it's proven, it's an ultra high value product that they're now can't make fast enough, so. When we get outside of, say, farming and fishing, um, electrification is enormous, right? We've got wonderful shipbuilders in the Northwest. Uh, we've got a huge effort going towards the electrification of our ferries, right? So that, that makes uh, for sound reduction, it's uh, greener, cleaner power, right? The ferries are one of the largest uh, emitters of diesel fuel, right? Huge variability in the cost of diesel fuel. Why not use some of that Northwest renewable hydropower and power our ferries with that? Norway's doing it. Uh, Joshua's working with them. We have a formal agreement with Norway to try to understand this better, but for sure some of the ferries and the fast ferries might come out towards electrification and the Northwest is perfectly suited for that. We've got the right uh, collaborative, innovative cycle. We've got the resource. Uh, you know, it's another one of those triple bottom lines. You're, uh, you're bringing jobs to the Northwest. You're reducing the sound input into the water, which is going to be better for uh, for our orcas and for the marine, uh, you know, the anthropogenic sound that we put in there. Uh, and you're developing an, an entire new technology that could be used throughout the world. Right with electrification goes software. I mean, that is really it. When we look at what these new electric cars are, when you look at the Tesla, not so much the cheap one that I have, the Nissan I have in my car, but 
it really is the software that makes those work, right? So those aspects will only grow as we go towards a more electrified uh, propulsion systems, whether they're small outboards or big ships or whatever they are in the docking and port facilities, you know, all that will mean more automation and more software. Again, Northwest is primed for that. We have, we've just got the core of the people here to be able to, to, to go towards that. Um, another one is large floating structures, right? We have a real problem with offshore wind is gonna be really hard to do here in the Northwest compared to the East Coast where you see big advances being made in structures like you see in the North Sea and off Norway. We need to make our platforms float, right? Awesome, there's the very first uh, floating platform now is under development. It's not done here in the Northwest. It's done in Portugal. Why did it have to happen there? Why couldn't we have done that here to employ our people in the tug industry, in the heavy steel industry, in the dry docks? You know, all that would work here because we're sitting on this enormous wind resource again. So there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, as I see it, just need a little bit of nudging, a little bit of connections that need to happen in order for these small seeds to grow into something better, or at least into a trial, maybe it fails, you know, we all, we all understand how innovation goes, but if we have that risk tolerance, right, and so often I'm, I feel so blessed that my, my boss gives me a license to fail, right, and I can bring that, I can share that with my team of 20 engineers that says, you know what, it's our job to push, and if we're not failing frequently, then we're not pushing hard enough. You know, why, why pick the low hanging fruit if you're in innovation? Why not choose those big things that may or may not pay off, but maybe one in 50 do or one in 10 do. And what might that look for an entire new industry that didn't exist before that, that could come out of this. So I'll stop there. There's plenty more, but those are the kind of things that as I was thinking about our talk yesterday, Laura, those are the, the ones that I came to my mind uh, kind of immediately. And there's many more, right? There's many, many more. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that's a common thread um, that I heard there is the constraint of why not here? Um, you know, there's a, there are so many good things that are happening um, around the world um, it, for innovations in this space. And I think one of the things that at least what, that I've seen come out of the last couple of months is barriers can be toppled when there's an urgency, mm. right? Um, to, you know, it makes me wonder, is there enough urgency yet in the situation to be able to start toppling some of those barriers that are preventing those things from happening here? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think not. I think that's, as I talk to my neighbor across the fence and I tell him what I'm doing in the ocean world and I explain to what I'm doing, I constantly have to think to myself, well, what does that mean to him or her, mm -hmm. right? And I can, I can really boil it down to a few things. That is a federal agency uh, for five cents a day. You guys are paying NOAA five cents a day for your weather forecast, right? That doesn't come from weather.com or AccuWeather. Those guys aggregate all the enormous amount, the billions of dollars of resources that NOAA uses for that. So that's one of those things that enabled and toppled an entire industry. If the baseline core data is made available in a common format per standards, then you start seeing all these innovative things that come out of that, whether you know, it's if you pick your weather app that you like looking at most and how they're gonna forecast whatever it is, golfing, fishing, maritime, but it's the core underlying data that makes that all happen. And that's taxpayer funded, yet it results in jobs, software. They can sell you phone ads now because they, they know that you know, I'm in Seattle and, and I like to fish, right? So they're look, always looking at, oh, Chris, Chris likes to fly fish. All right, very good. I'm gonna be sending him these type of these types of ads. So I think the awareness needs to be out there. In the end, it's getting to Congress because I feel after 30 some years of doing this, people are connected to the ocean in a, in a strange way, right? It's really weird. Uh, I think we both are drawn to the ocean. We love being there. We love being on the shore. But then there's also a fear of the ocean, whether it's something you know that's in the water or a tsunami or whatever it comes. So we're a little we're a little schizo on the ocean. We're drawn to it, but there's also a fear to it. And there's so few people that have been out on the high seas and have been out away from the horizon that they can't connect to it very well. They don't know what it means to see some of the, you know, I'm sure Randy, the, the isolation that you see out there and the end to end sky to sky horizon, you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's just completely unique. So the challenge is how do we get people to care about it? Well, 
what part of the ocean affects them directly. What are those services that the ocean has been doing for us for a long time, like absorbing carbon? Mm -hmm. That's a huge one. And now the bill is coming due in carbon sequestration, right? There's only so much that the ocean can absorb. And now we're seeing acidified oceans, which is horrendous for coral reefs. It's horrendous for shell making uh, life forms. Um, yet we know some things that we could start doing immediately to help that, right? It's a, it's a long road, but each year we delay, it's that old exponential game, just like we've seen in COVID, right? It gets exponentially worse. If we don't do the easy things that make money today, employ people, uh, do the right thing for the planet, and we do those 10 years from now, it gets that much harder down the road. So I, those, are, those are great questions, Laura. I don't know what to do about that. I really, I'm not sure. Uh, I, think, I think like the Washington uh, Maritime Blue is really good and we're really lucky to have uh, an advocate like Governor Inslee for the ocean. Again, because he's connected to the ocean. His family is directly there, so he understands that. I, I think that connection point and expressing that connection is, is helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I think something you said there um, resonated for me about what service does the ocean provide to us that we can connect with. Um, sometimes innovation doesn't have to be the big changes that occur. Sometimes we can do little things um, to make headway. I mean, I, I think about a company like Vital Choice and what, you know, was probably a really outside idea um, in 2001 to start trying to sell you know, seafood to, to the average person um, and, and being able to, to find inroads like that to be able to, to find that service point, to find how it connects to people, I think is, is a really important one. Any other, anything else that you've seen or, um, and I don't know if Randy wants to speak up and say anything about some of those challenges that he may have had, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you. Um, or just, you know, what else, what else are those other little pieces that might be able to happen? What are some of the things that, that we could be thinking about? Well, I think there's always power, right? There's always how do we get wave power? There's been a lot invested in that. And I'm, after spending so much time in designing these systems, I'm not sure it's going to compete well in the short term if we try to convert wave power into grid rate electrical power. But here's where it could work. It could work if we had fast deployable systems that like after a hurricane where they've got no infrastructure, right? You look at like Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. you could completely uh, get around an island and put in power generating systems for let's just say Puerto Rico and deliver clear water, uh, electric power completely without any land-based infrastructure, you pretty much drag the cables ashore and you can start helping people like that. You know, military applications or the, the work that I do, I would love to have unattended uh, low cost power out there that's that's reliable to do. So I think the marine power sector uh, in renewables is is also uh, you know another another one of those areas that could be um, that could be really helpful. Um, I think in the you know in the value proposition and really Randy should be talking about this in sustainably harvest seafoods. You know how do you how do you distinguish yourself right from uh, you know, imported seafood. If you say this was sustainably caught, it was harvested in this way. That is worth something to people. People have paid money for that. So that model is kind of there now. Okay, how do we make better advantage of that? To, uh, you know, we all here connect, uh, uh, you know, from farm to table. How do we make the equivalent in, in either marine aquaculture or from fisher to table, right? To understand that. I think it's happening. I think it could happen a lot faster. I think there's many, many more opportunities in there for very small in entrepreneurs to connect directly with the consumer and form CSA-like things, but for fishing, right? And it, it might be with all the vari variations that we have in the Northwest with fishing, you don't know when the salmon's gonna be, you don't know what the regulations are gonna be. But from my friend that are fishermen that are doing it, people are still willing to pay a premium for that, for premium line caught trawl salmon compared to not knowing where it comes from or not being connected with that farmer or processor or smoker or whatever it is. So I think that provides huge opportunity. It's kind of tangible to our heritage and, and available to a lot of people, right? With the right resources. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, 
You know, so one of the other things that uh, you and I talked a little bit about, and then I want to make sure we give time for other people to ask some questions because there's a few people who sent some in through the chat. Um, but one of the last things that you and I were talking about yesterday that I thought was, um, you know, was really interesting is to be thinking about why it can be so challenging to have innovation come from within. And one of the comments on here was about, you know, moving from government to private industry, you know, sort of, you know, call a SpaceX kind of thing to be able to get some of these things done. Is it more than just moving to private industry? Is it sometimes having to get outside of the industry itself to be able to to truly get innovation happening? Yeah, I mean, I can I can speak to a very concrete example, and um, I you know I led a paper just it's just six months old, so I'll be glad to share that on public private partnership, right? It has to do with marine robotics, right? So here we we partnered with a company in Alameda to develop a uh, an ocean going drone that it was the first drone to completely go around the world. So we circumnavigated around Antarctica in the winter, worst part of the year, right? could not have been done by government, could not have been done by private industry alone because they didn't have uh, the sensing aspect. So we met up, very good boat builder, lifelong sailor, incredible engineer, right? And my group brought in the sensing aspects of that. Together we partnered and we developed this drone that said, well, what type of problems might we wanna solve with this? And here's where the innovation part comes in and where he was able to lure people away. He's in you know, Silicon Valley, right? Alameda. He was able to lure away washed up 30 year olds, right? That had been in Apple and at Netflix software engineers that were like, okay, we've made money. Now what, how do we do good? They're 30 years old. They come to a company like SailDrone. The speed and the innovation that we could move with top talent because he was able to draw from industry. Mm -hmm. We grew the company from uh, five years ago. He was two people. I was just on the phone with him this morning. He's at 150. He has 100 drones in his warehouse now. We have 25 on the water that we've launched because the ships can't launch right now, right? So all the NOAA ships are tied to the dock. Mm. We've got, we pushed, we pushed uh, seven off the dock in Alameda. They're about 600 miles south of Dutch Harbor now, right? So they're about to go into the Bering Sea. Some of them are gonna go clear into the Beaufort Sea to do studies, right? So these are things that I couldn't have envisioned uh, just five. When we started this, I would have not thought, hey, we're going to have a pandemic. All that work you did is going to prove itself uh, in, in five years. So we get a five-year payback, right? And, and uh, so those innovations of coming from other industries, again, these guys were software guys, and we looked at things that we didn't look at how, you know, we can, I can pretty much pilot them from my smartphone, right? So I, I can see, look at these drones where they're at, pilot them, give them commands. I can see the data. We can have them work in group behavior together to look for things. They're gonna be, uh, uh, they've got echo sounders on board. So we're gonna be mapping uh, Bering Sea Pollock because there's no ships up this year. So we're gonna get a good idea of what the Pollock are doing. I can't emphasize that enough, how important it is to, to one, industry people like me, I'll say, just people, not me personally, maybe the pr people like me in my seat have to have an openness towards that. If mm -hmm. they think, you know, I really hate the word expert and really I don't like being called an expert when everybody says I'm an expert, expert implies you're done learning, right? It's, it, it, to me, I don't, I don't wanna be called that. I always wanna be a learning, growing ideas. So I'll say people in the field need to be open enough to be hearing from outside the industry um, I can't say how many times that we've gone in a conference room together and someone from outside will bring up an idea. And if, you know, not just in the maritime sector, but experts anywhere, if they're open enough to take that in for a moment and take that fragile nest egg, right? Somebody offered an idea and it really needs to be treated with respect because they're putting their ego on the line, maybe a heavy investment ideas that they've cultivated and just let it sit there for a while and simmer and guard it carefully and nurture it. Things can come out of there in a very short time frame that, that I just would have never expected. You know, we all went into the conference room with different ideas and yet a third idea came out of the conference room afterwards. It's a process. It's something I think the Northwest is pretty good at. I don't know if it's our long winters or gray skies or whatever it is, but we seem to be an innovation hotbed. You don't need to look very far to understand that, I think. So those are things I would, um, 
I'd love to hear from you guys about that. Number one, how that's worked in your life, and, and if you guys have observed that, and then also how do we how do we do more of that in uh, I'll say in COVID times, you know, now when we're more isolated, but just in general, in particular to ocean problems, where my typical timeline that I've observed is about ten years from innovation to a product when you've actually got something that's commercial available or it's delivering scientific quality products and research papers it's about a decade and that's across the board across many many different things we don't have many decades left we need to reduce that dramatically you know sail drone i felt like we got it down to five years how do we get it to three what really are the barriers if you really look at the the root cause why can't we go faster uh, yeah that's a great question. Um, I, I'm curious if there's, uh, if anybody has thoughts about some of that, by all means, this is, you know, this is an opportunity to sort of, to, to go into some, some conversation around it. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have come up on here, so um, we can, we can kind of talk through that, but then if somebody's got some ideas about, um, to that last point of how, how do we um, move that um, somebody was asking a question actually about from the state's perspective, um, what do we do in maritime in innovation to try and get, you know, some kind of 10 time impact that allows us to, to scale these things more quickly? Um, you know, is it, you're asking about ship hole designs, uh, new fuels, ad uh, adaptive vessel printing, ocean fishing technologies, you know, is there anything that you see right now um, that can that can accelerate that way? I mean, the answer is yes. It's really one of those things that if you've got the proper set of lenses on, you see opportunity everywhere. You really do. And all of those industries that we talked about in, you know, marine shipbuilding, how do we get, um, you know, I know Vigor is looking at employing robotics to do ship welding and automation? How do we do, you know, more of that to keep our ship industries and be competitive with Asia here? You know, we're going to have to innovate. It's innovate or die. It's not really a choice, right? So particular with those, there, there literally are so many places that have opportunities. It really is a matter of picking something that you're passionate. If, if we were talking to hundreds of people, pick, just pick one that you really can get behind. There's not one optimal thing, right? If it can have a triple bottom line where it's better for society, it provides job, it's good for the environment, and oh, by the way, it's gonna make money and bring taxes in, oh my goodness, that, that's the home run, right? That's, that's wonderful to do that. And I, and I think there are plenty of those. It's really about connections, getting, getting people together so that they trust each other and they're willing to say, you know, I've just, Chris, I've got this little idea. I, I don't know how it's gonna go, but what do you think? You know, and, and being trust, worthy with each other. I think that goes a long way towards innovation and being um, not just good uh, leaders, but also good and responsible followers, right? It really means something. We, we so often put the leader up there at the pinnacle of things, but there's also good things about being a responsible and good follower and giving responsible feedback towards innovations. And many people feel like, uh, that I've seen it in maritime and these other things that I've been involved with, they're like, you know, I, I, I'm not a leader. I'm not that. But can you tell me what, how I can be involved in this? How can I be uh, a good cheerleader, a good social media director? You know, what, what other role can I help with this effort? So understanding that, that not everybody's a leader, not everybody's an innovator, but that the follower role of being a good and responsible follower is very key because that builds momentum. As soon as you have followers that get on board at technology and they're like, hey, I can connect A to B here and we can build a bigger group, suddenly there's like a critical mass that happens and there's enough connections that are made um, that that can make a difference. It really can. I want, um, I, I want, I'm going to step back to Randy for just a second. I'm going to put you on the spot for a moment, Randy. I'm just curious from the, from the you know, you're, you're on the consumer side um, of, of seeing some of these things. Is there anything you've seen in innovation that's that's happened? I mean, just even in the last couple of months, that really sort of, um, especially in this industry, that that sort of made you go, "Wow, that's that's pretty cool." Has there been anything that's popped up um, from that consumer side? Well, if I could go back to Chris's earlier point about what we can all—I mean, it just seems 
painfully obvious to me that the one thing we can all do is stop electing science denying politicians. It's just, it's just, uh, you know, in Alaska, uh, got this incredible fishery up there that produces 50, 60 million salmon a year and the current EPA is, is trying to promote an open pit mine that is going to jeopardize this, this most incredible sustainable food resource, one of the most sustainable food resources on the planet. And, it, and totally ignoring the science, all the work that's been done for a decade showing how devastating this could be. So that's my personal <laughs> mission is to uh, try to educate people. Uh, well, most people, thinking people know that uh, Sci we, we need to listen to our scientists and let them make the decisions. And uh, uh, as far as innovation, one thing I have seen, there's an organization uh, based in Vancouver called Plastic Bank. And basically what they've done is uh, created uh, sort of an economy around picking up plastic. And so they, they will go around the world, a lot of third world countries, where people are desperate for income and they'll actually pay them to collect the debris on the beaches and then they'll uh, process it, they'll put in a little processing plant. And then the end result is you have a, you have a, sort of a certified sustainable plastic uh, mm -hmm. raw material that, that you can then use for different products that will carry a logo that, uh, uh, right. I, I, their, their uh, website is plasticbank.com and uh, I think that's great. And they are growing as far as I know, they're, they're building more of these things. And uh, cause it is a lot of the third world countries, uh, as I understand it, that are producing a lot of the ocean plastic. Um, as far as the fishing industry itself, uh, you know, I think the boats are generally getting more efficient, but they still use diesel. Uh, uh, but they're, they're pretty efficient at, at harvesting the food and, uh, I guess that's about it. Yeah, thank you. No, that's that's great. I, you know, I um, I appreciate the the insight on some of those um, on 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 some of the reasons why we have to we have to think about what it is that that we're doing to to uh, help with our our oceans health without a doubt. One other comment I had uh, earlier, Chris was talking about you know the issue of sustainability, and one really hopeful thing that I've seen uh, in the last twenty years is more and more consumers are understanding this problem and more and more consumers are looking for sustainable seafood. Yeah. Uh, at one count there were 30 different NGOs that were s doing some sort of certifying of so-called sustainable seafood. I think the gold standard uh, in most people's judgment is the Marine Stewardship Council which uh, we've been a, a member, a licensee for almost the, uh, as long as we've been in business and uh, basically what they do is uh, they, they're the gold standard because they're the most, uh, they have the most robust certification process. Sometimes it can take years. Basically what they do is they look at the fishery and, and uh, sort of endorse it as well-managed and, uh, and sustainable. And um, in the last 10 years, fisheries around the world have, have uh, rebounded, stabilized, still have a way, long ways to go, but uh, uh, but msc.org is, is their website and uh, uh, more and more people are looking looking for this and I think one big win that they had is they, they actually got McDonald's to, to buy only MSC certified fish for their fish sandwiches which may not sound like a big deal but it's unbelievable how many yeah. millions and millions of fish sandwiches they, you know, oh. they produce in a year so I only imagine. Uh, one of the big shipping lines, uh, Maersk, I think one of the big shipping lines decided that they were only going to transport certified sustainable seafood. And so if you're fishing in an area that is not well managed, if you're not harvesting the fish sustainably, all of a sudden now you've lost your market, you can't transport it anymore. And so that has had a, a cumulative effect to create, uh, you put more pressure on the fisheries to clean up their act. That's actually that's a really good point that um, I think is is important for people to 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 keep in mind is sometimes it's those little things um, that can have an impact that you know goes up the chain. Um, sometimes when we think innovation, we try to think innovation has to be that big impact immediately, and it it really doesn't have to be. Sometimes it can be those pieces that that impact one element of the chain and it goes all the way up. So that's um, I really appreciate you saying that. 
there was a, another question I want to make sure I get to a couple of the questions that were here before we run out of time um, with Chris. Um, somebody was asking, Chris, you'd mentioned about the kelp uh, farms and somebody asked about, let me see if we can get back to the question here. Um, what infrastructure is needed or lacking for kelp farming? Yeah, so uh, the, the state of Maine is doing this the best, right? So I can send resources to that to understand what it looks like, but there's, um, you know, just picture uh, a bunch of stringer lines that are doped with seeds a bunk, uh, across a bunch of floating buoys with proper permitted areas. And then they come back with, um, you know, what looks like modified long line recovery gear uh, and strip the various types of kelp. Each kelp species has a little bit different adaptation of that. Uh, but it's mostly, uh, you know, nutrient rich waters in areas that are close to shore, small boat. These are not like factory trawler type things that I've seen. A lot of things overseas in the Philippines and China, which you see are much more floating platforms and they can be, and you can see them from space, right? You can look at the, the masses of those where all the seafood comes from. I think for, for our culture here, the best would really be to look at the state of Maine. And I can send the, I forgot the guy's name, who's, he, he's, he's out there on YouTube. If you look him up, he's very well uh, known. Uh, and you can find out and plenty of on the water pictures, wonderful thing to see that. And, um, you know, we did do some minor work here in Hood Canal to try to look at it. Um, but again, that's another area where it's going to take public private partnership because permitting is going to be involved at the, at the regional state, county, local, federal level, whenever we're in our waterways, right? There's hazards, there's navigational hazards. This is where the value of public private partnership can really come in. Uh, in that a lot of the hurdles can get going away, taken away, where the small farmer could just never afford to do that. He or she is going to need some help, right, to do this. So PPP is a great way to look towards farming. And I'll be glad to put together a resource list of things that I know. It's not my business. I don't know it. Uh, but I am absolutely uh, convinced that um, there's, there's opportunity there. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, Steve, do you want to pipe up here for a second? You asked something about, uh, or you made a comment about fast fabrication, message testing, and marketing. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, the fast fabric, like when we talk about where's your idea, what is your idea, um, and how to go from just something that you've, you've got in your head to something that's tangible that you can put out there. Um, fast fabrication, I think, is going to just continue to uh, become one of these things where within a matter of days, you can whether it's uh, large scale 3D printing, whether it's um, specialized milling, um, there's all kinds of really cool new extrusion techniques um, where you can actually just do a 3D model of something and then put it out there and then immediately start testing it. Um, I, I see this as like the biggest, I, I mean, message testing comes in too because this is something that I deal with right now. What is the right message? How do I get in front of the right people who can then be a force multiplier for my message. Um, you know, I'm still working out the kinks on mine, but I think this is something that uh, socially will will continue to refine over the next few years of, okay, I've got something that's critical and something that needs to have a solution. Um, how do I get that in front of the right people faster? Because right now we all drown in a sea of uh, competing, you know, products and advertisements and so what how do you how do you actually tier these things where or, or categorize them and this is important for the world this is important for our state this is important for ocean for the ocean and therefore everything else i i think that's that's huge also because you might be able to build your product within 24 hours um but if you don't get it in front of the right people you'll either run out of money or you'll yourself lose interest and go well this isn't worth it um so i, I mean i just off the top of my head, those are the first things that came out were, okay, make it quickly and sort of that lean, uh, that lean startup kind of idea where you, you've got you've to make it fast and start iterating quickly. Um, how do we get these different versions and how do we get something refined within a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, to, as to that end, um, somebody else asked whether or not there are bulletin boards or resources for people who do have um, ideas in the ocean health space to be able to connect with, um, you know, maybe we won't call them experts, but we'll call them, <laughs> we'll call them something um, who are, who are people who are interested in that learning. Do you know of any, Chris, that are, are out there 
Um, oh, totally. I mean, Maritime Blue is, is really all about that, right? We're currently with the port's help, we're building a Maritime Innovation Center uh, in Ballard, right? So they're, they're going to, the Port of Seattle is going to invest several million dollars, ten, several tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. in a actual physical location. Right now we're virtual, right? Mm -hmm. So all these things that, you know, the stuff that Steve was talking about, we're already doing. That's already underway. So if people are looking for community, that's a great one. It's right within our state. There are resources available. The governor is making resources available, whether it's uh, people expertise or people like WeWork that can help understand and sharpen your message. Or if, you know, so often for me, it's just if I have a group of other uh, people that I can, I can hear myself think, basically, if I can just use it as a sounding board rather than, okay, I've been in the shop all day by myself working <laughs> at some point. You know, you need to air out those ideas once you feel comfortable doing so, and that'll get all this moving much faster. And, and like Steve was talking about, fast fabrication or fast development of ideas. And you know, Chris, actually, I'm I'm uh, right with you when I when I say expert. You become when you become an expert, you kind of become unteachable. Yep. Um, and and there was a Harvard lecturer just recently that was talking about the jobs of the future and the people of the future. They're not going to have this pointed, hey, I'm an expert in this one thing here. It's going to be a more of a generalist way of thinking and how everything connects. Um, you know, I'm the same way. This actually might be something, uh, the Catalyst competition is a perfect example of this. Like, we're not looking necessarily for experts in any of these fields. We're looking for people with good ideas, regardless of your industry. Um, if you can apply it to an industry, if somebody is in, uh, you know, something far off like toy making and they have something for health uh why would you throw that out immediately you know uh, they they are literally the out of the box thinkers and i think as we bring this to the common folk <laughs> the non-experts as we get it out there to everybody else i think that's going to be a big part of growing um you know all this is find those opinions that are outside of your industry every once in a while yep find them and nurture them right so often you know, you have to encourage people to want to do that, right? So uh, it, it's a double-edged sword, right? The person that's got it has to be seeking it and the, and the community has to be welcoming it, right? And I find once that welcome mat is rolled out there, uh, a lot more people tend to call again because there's some basic of, uh, of trust built or the person knows I can, I can sign an NDA quickly. He and I want to discuss something maybe nothing to do with Noah. maybe on the periphery it does. At least that's a step, right, to get further inroads and then connections happen, email introductions, and then it can, it can all go very quickly from there. Well, thank you, Chris. I wanna stop because I know it's one o'clock and, and you were kind enough to, to give us some time today. Um, just a couple of things I'll point out too. There's a, um, within the group chat, there's uh, Randy shared a couple of resources and things that if people are interested in learning more um, there were a couple of, I saw movies that you mentioned as well as some other resources. So be sure to take a quick look at those. I won't end the meeting right away if people want to be able to look at that stuff. But thank you again, um, Chris. For yeah, glad to do it. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry you guys didn't get Joshua, but at the same point, I was glad to meet you guys and, and hopefully we can be connected again at some other point. That sounds good. And thank you everyone else for, for being here and for your uh, contributions. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much. Thank you for the invite. Bye now. You're welcome. Thanks, Randy. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye now. Bye. Good to meet you all.